band. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, David has asked me to tell you a bit about how I got into the psychoid. So I thought I'd go back a few decades. Um, and uh, because my starting point was clinical, I also thought uh, it would be quite helpful to suggest to you Lara's paper, Meeting the Orphan, because in a way, some of what she writes about now would have been relevant had I known it then. Um, I did the analytic training at the SAP, and just after I'd qualified in the late 1990s, I had an experience in a session which I couldn't make sense of. I couldn't make head nor tail of it. I could think about it intellectually, but it was uh, rather alien to me. I thought I'd uh, read out to you the countertransference experience that I puzzled over a great deal at the time. I probably puzzle over it much less if this kind of experience happened now, but uh, then it was really very strange to me. Um, I was uh, in an in, I was working with um, a woman in her middle ages, middle age, in an intensive analysis, and she came into treatment with me some years earlier because uh, she felt very cut off from herself, from her family, from people around her from a good many things. And it was very difficult to get any affect into the session. And uh, interpretations about starting to value working with me and so on uh, generally met a bit of a, a, a blank wall. And um, we were coming up to a Christmas break and um, I was making interpretations about the fact that she might find the break quite difficult because by then we were working five times a week and suddenly she'd have three weeks with no sessions. And these interpretations were dismissed and she talked about how busy she was. And um, I eventually made an interpretation about uh, uh, the busyness that she gets into pushing out of an aspect of herself that then feels made homeless. And somehow this seemed to reach her. But at that point, I had this countertransference experience. Uh, an image came into my mind in which I reached out and placed a little carved wooden angel on a surface by a single bed to watch over um, a child in the bed. I, I didn't know it was a child immediately, but a small child's hand reached out in response and grabbed the angel, which gave me pleasure in this image. Although it seemed to be me, Anne, placing the angel on the bedside table, I had the distinct impression that I was a man the visual image, I was quite used to having visual images, was accompanied in me by something that was completely strange to me, a visceral physical sense of a shape incursion into my psychic space, like a small snatching hand growing forwards right into what felt like my yielding psychic body and a very distinct instinctual sense of satisfaction, which apparently came from the child. Um, I had to file this away because I, I couldn't make sense of the more sensory aspects. I was used to having quite vivid visual images in um, the countertransference and in my own analysis when, when I uh, was in analysis as um, prior to, during and uh, after my training. And um, I, out of that, I made a, an interpretation about childhood experiences of absence, and this time they actually did get received. So uh, 
I was left with this strange experience. And out of that, I set about wondering the relationship of body and mind and self and other. Um, at the time I was on the University Liaison Committee of the SAP and Carl Filio representing Essex University was also on um, the committee and I asked him, uh, not really thinking that I would get the answer that I did, did he think one could base a PhD studying this kind of experience? And um, it, it took obviously time to get to that, but the answer was yes. And I enrolled at Essex and he became my supervisor. And uh, when he said to me, where did I want to start? I said, I think I need to start with Jung's attitudes to body and mind. And I've decided to begin with the psychoid, although I knew very little about it because I thought that this was the deepest level that I might begin from. I then came to the view that one can only appreciate what uh, a concept means if you try and understand what is in the mind of the author when they conceive it. So I started going back through the history. And um, obviously I came up with references to Hans Driesch. That was a footnote in, in um, uh, Jung that, that uh, set me off. And I found the reference to um, the psychoid in Jung's correspondence with Freud. So this was about starting from 1903 and 1907. Um, and was puzzled by the fact that these very early references uh, came so much before the writing in On the Nature of the Psyche and the synchronicity work. Um, and I puzzled about this. Uh, I, I noted that uh, Jung wrote about the irrepresentable and the unknowable. Um, it's interesting that something that is both of these can engender so much writing um, when in theory, one, there's nothing that can be said about these states in some ways. Um, I'm not a philosopher, so uh, I had to pick up what philosophy I did as I went along. I came to the conclusion that uh, there was more than enough in the earlier work for me to write about the psychoid in its... Uh, phase before Jung really got to grips with synchronicity. I decided that uh, this was the biological area, um, largely out of Driesch's experiments with sea urchins and the um, monistic view of the body-mind issue uh, covered by that could cover what I needed to learn about and more than enough for a, a PhD rather than the uh, physics um, and the panpsychic view or however you now would conceive that, but I conceived it then as panpsychic uh, to do with the matter mind issue and synchronicity. So I also saw that, that Jung's earlier understandings of the psychoid and his later understandings of synchronicity were conceptually different. You have to go back nearly 20 years. To, I'm trying to put you in my mindset then. Um, the former being considered as a teleological ordering factor, uh, imminent as potential in the stuff of the organism, creating an emergent dynamic. Uh, by which the life process of the organism unfolds, and the latter by contrast being considered as a form of knowledge or meaning arising when two or more events that are not causally related nonetheless have a meaningful connection. So I thought that synchronicity could supervene on 
uh, the psychoid concept, but not underpin it, whereas the psychoid concept could be thought about underpinning um, the synchronicity ideas and might usefully be investigated without referring to the latter. I had to make do with hints at the time because I started to research this before uh, the publication of the Red Book. My ideas took a leap forward when the Red Book was published and I was lucky enough to study with Sonu in the early seminars where we read through the Red Book and I was able to expand my thinking um, in the hermeneutic direction to a considerable extent. I thought what might be interesting is how the field has burgeoned since I began. The very first PEP web search I did yielded just 13 hits for the word psychoid. Uh, one was the reference to the Jung Freud letters. Two were papers by Freud dismissing the term psychoid as merely philosophical. Uh, there was a paper by Reich, which reviewed uh, the Bloiler paper on the psychoid from 1925. A year later, there were 20 hits, and by September 2014, when I was coming to the end of my PhD and writing it up, there were 185 hits. So I haven't done a, a more recent one. But... Um, in Jung's initial writings, it's never been a particularly prominent uh, topic, but nowadays there are a huge number of papers some, and books and so on covering this area. So you see, my interest is both historical and clinical. Um, I thought I wouldn't go into it further than this, that there are papers that you can read, but I thought it would be interesting from this uh, clinical beginning, followed by a historical development. I did do an empirical study as well, which was challenging the psychoid concept. I interviewed um, a number of Jungian analysts from all over the world, and I interviewed a number of post-Freudians from the um, uh, Freudian Institute in London to see if when I presented them with the session that I have told you the counter-transference moment from, to see how they from their own orientations would interpret it. Uh, quite interesting, a few of the Freudians um, came up with ideas very much like the ones I'd gleaned out of studying Jung. So uh, that was quite pleasing. Um, and it did, in my view, confirm that this was a justifiable clinical concept. Um, and people are using it clinically a lot nowadays, I think. Laura like, writes about synchronistic experiences, and I can certainly from my perspective now, looking back, uh, feel attuned to that sort of experience in clinical sessions. But when I first started this, they were very strange to me. I'm very happy to answer any questions and I'm also happy to open the discussion to uh, people wanting to talk about Lara's paper and what they made of it and where that takes them, or perhaps where that takes them on the back of this introduction. Uh, Anne, Anne I'd, I'd like to uh, hear more about why you thought the, the visions and the images you had in the session were, was counter-transference rather than a bridge to something that you're deeply attuned to with your patient.
I suppose that comes down to how you conceive the clinical session and the experience between self and other that takes place in the session. And I explored that in the empirical study that I did, the interviews. Um, I like the notion of Francois Martin Vallas that what takes place in the clinical session is an encounter where something happens that includes both analyst and patient and what takes place between them. Um, I was using the word counter-transference at the time of the session because I was not yet conceiving the process in the way I would now do so. Um, I was very puzzled because it certainly went beyond any understanding of myself out of my analysis. So that immediately made me start thinking, then this is counter-transference. Um, the hugely interesting thing that emerged later was the little figure that I was putting beside the bed was absolutely manifestly a little wooden carved angel in the image. I had no idea why we sh I should come up with that. Um, I have quite a faith base. The patient didn't particularly. Um, two years later, I learned that her artist father had carved an angel and she now owned it and it meant a huge amount to her. It had helped carry her through some very, very difficult periods. It was only at that point that I could look backwards and think, ah, oh, so that was why it was an angel. And perhaps that's why I was a man in the sensory image space. Um, so that's another reason why I thought that I was later able to think, ah, oh, this must be about the patient when I, I couldn't find it in myself to think I'm having some kind of parallel processing situation. I don't know if that answers your question, John. Well, it sounds like a mystical moment. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's mysterious. Um, did you say that the father carved the angel two years later, or you found out two years later? I found out two years later. He carved the angel many years earlier. In fact, by the time she started working with me, he was no longer alive, but her mother was still alive. And it did feel like a mystical experience. And when I reread Lara's paper uh, for today, I've read it a, a number of times previously, but when I reread it, the word beyond sort of leapt off the page at me because this felt like something beyond. Mm -hmm. I also worried, this is, I, I'm, I hope you don't mind if I, I'm digressing a bit perhaps. I spent a good deal of the early part of my PhD worrying that I would do damage to the clinical work by um, moving into an intellectual space to investigate something. Uh, this conflict dogged me from beginning to end in a variety of different ways. I worried about using a clinical session. Would it have an effect on the patient? I worried about um, putting some clinical material into the uh, PhD uh, thesis and papers. Um, how should I think about publishing that? Uh, 
the, the views on publication of clinical material have changed a lot since then. I spent a lot of time discussing with Carl about applying for ethical approval and, and how I would approach that. I contemplated only doing a historical study in order not to clash with clinical material in, in the face of this conflict. And I worried about it again when I was uh, doing my interviews, what the effect might be on the clinical work by interviewing. Uh, so I did uh, 12 interviews with analysts and a group discussion with another six. And uh, so there were three and three in the, the group discussion and uh, six and six in the interviews of different orientations. I, I worried and discussed with Carl about the um, ethical aspect of that too. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, these are rare moments that um, should be savored. Well, thank, thank you for receiving it actually, because it's, it's a long time since I've spoken about the, these aspects of the PhD. I, th I think it sits okay with me now. Um, one of the things that, that Carl and I got to was when you use material, you have to monitor the ongoing transference to try and pick up in that what effects might be going back in from me and my PhD process. That, that it seemed to be possible to work out something ethical that way. Sarah, you look as if you want to say something, but you're muted. So I can see you're gesticulating. <laughs> um, I was just wondering um, what it was that um, induced you to want to take it into the realms of the PhD. A number of things. Um, we're getting into quite personal stuff here. I come from an academic family although I don't really live up to them, but I think I have a sort of idealized view of academic work. Well, I did then, I'm not sure that I do now, but um, that was an aspect. And I got really interested in what was going on at Essex because they were just starting up the professional doctorate process. Um, at the time that I was on, this was before I did my PhD, and at the time I was on the University Liaison Committee, which was set up partly to set up the professional doctorate process. And of course, those were clinical studies because the whole idea was that the clinical training was accredited prior learning. And you could go from the clinical training into a, a shortened professional doctorate. And I found myself involved in discussions with Bob and Carl about setting that up and what they uh, envisioned for it and with Nick Midgley who uh, ran it in the beginning and I found myself rather to my alarm uh, doing a little bit of teaching on that which I felt I was completely out of my depth with but the more I, I kind of read up on the program that they set up the more interested I got and it really mm. stemmed from that. Right, thank you. Jeremy? I, <clears throat> I have a comment and a question. I, I found the paper interesting, uh, especially the comparison between the folklore figures of the hero and the orphan. The, he the hero and the orphan, the hero going out, yeah. um, doing great things and returning a hero, and the orphan just trying to find a home. But um, the question, um, 
I just was a bit puzzled on page nine, second paragraph. Um, it's referring to Ogden um, and the unlived life that needs to be revisited and relived in the transference, this time within the area of omnipotence. And I didn't really understand what, what that was. I don't know whether you whether that means anything to you, the area of omnipotence. It means something to me, but I wonder whether we want to open this up to a more generalized view. I'm not quite, do, do other people want to contribute or shall I keep, shall I keep talking? Well, if it means something to you, perhaps you could. Yeah, that. I think I'm going to I'm I'm going to keep this perhaps within my personal experience and clinical area, because um, although I'm we're, we're talking about the psychoid concept and Jung's work on that and and how the concept developed in his mind throughout his life. Um, I feel as if I'm, having started where I did, I'm sort of thrown back into my experience where I think you, in analysis, in an intensive analysis, you regress, but I don't quite see regression in an object relations sense where you regress back to early infancy, but I think you regress to all the layers that may come from that period, which take you into an imaginal unus mundus, which is really beyond your conscious experience, a realm where these alien experiences can happen and synchronicities. And where you meet your analyst, in encounters that are beyond your anticipation and beyond your knowledge in a way. And perhaps that is the area of omnipotence that Winnicott is referring to in, a, in an experiential sense. I suppose there's an interest, isn't there, in whether one thinks about the psychoid clinically, which is what I've chosen to do today and with Lara's paper, or whether you approach it more philosophically or more historically or more intellectually. And perhaps we've got a that those of you who are here today come from a, a, a variety of, of different disciplines and approaches towards this. So it might be interesting to see where you all get to. I find uh, a lot of the discussions about uh, psychoid and synchronicity and all of that frustrating because um, seems to me part of what Jung's saying about the psychoid is it cannot be experienced. So it's a concept that uh, 
tries to articulate something that's actually not experienceable. So it's, it's useful to have some language for what we, how we conceive of it, but it's not something that can be experienced. And so like in Lara's paper where she talks about openness to the psychoid or whatever, um, I find that uh, uh, it's like you can't manufacture synchronicity and you can't manufacture a psychoid experience and so on. So I do find all of that, uh, I get impatient. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, you get a lot, I think we get a lot of mileage by distinguishing between psychic and psychological. That I would say your experience was a psychic experience, that it was a real encounter between you and your patient uh, in which psychic communication happened. Um, and then it sort of later became psychological as you were able to digest it and the subjective element of it was developed. Um, but I guess I don't know quite what mileage there is in calling it psychoid. Um, that's, that's so for me, psychic experience, you know, is just everyday stuff that happens all the time. So um, I'm not sure that, uh, to, uh, th so I would prefer psychoid to be preserved in a way <laughs> <laughs> or uh, for, as an idea and so on. Well, but, uh, Misha's got his hand up there. Hi, David. Hi, Anne. Hi, Misha. Um, yeah, I, I think what, what struck me um, from reading the paper is that there's something about the psychoid itself that's that's or orphaned. Um, because although, you know, the suggestion is this thing is, is biological, deeper, essentialized um at the same point there's a sense of loss too attached to this thing that i think as david like you know rightly described is is kind of slightly um low on attainability mileage wise how do you get there um yeah i i, I kind of felt like the paper might have you know, gone that far in a way. I'm wondering what you think about that. Um, I'm a bit hooked on David's thinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> the My initial experience was quite emphatically psyche and soma. I don't know if David conceives soma as being part of psyche and i went to the psychoid concept initially because it seemed to be the place where you get the monism where psyche and soma uh, may be uh, unitary um, i rather like atman's pache the, the recent notion of a decomposable dual aspect monism that can uh, dissolve into its its uh, separate parts. But, but when I recently listened to him, I couldn't get to my notion of psychoid exactly. So um, that's, that's up for discussion. I, I do agree, David. I, th I think that it's unknowable, irrepresentable and beyond. But I think something, I feel that something comes out of it something which is uh which links psyche and soma and self and other in in a way that most of the rest of Jung doesn't so clearly articulate but i guess it's is it an articulation or an experience is and uh 
I mean, I think trying to articulate that stuff <laughs> that impinges upon us is really important. Um, but, uh, mm. uh, and I started from an, a completely experiential place and curiously, I'm a rather thrown back into it today. And Lara's paper also put me back into an experiential space. Uh, just one last thing I'll say about the paper is I, I did find it a bit annoying because she was throwing the kitchen sink at this thing. <laughs> So it was like every possible theory was going to find a place in this schema. <laughs> and uh, so then uh, I wondered, oh, well, what's, 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 there's no like gaps, you know, or a breeze from the beyond to get through here. It's like, it's all like fitted into place. Um, and, um, Yeah, I'm I'm trying to um, think my way through it as well. Um, like it, when you were first presenting, I was I was wondering if the cycloid was similar to Freud's notion of the trebe, where it's the you know the borderland between psyche and and embodiment, and then. When David mentions this ineffability that we can't really experience the psychoid, and now it's like beyonds, you know, O oh, or Lacanian real. There's this inaccessibility to know it in itself. Yet there seems to be a transcendental element to it that's or maybe even a transcendent, meaning that we're getting at an ontological aspect of, of psyche or cosmos. <laughs> um, and we are limited in our language. And that's why it almost seemed mystical to me. And, and when I don't know how to label something, I, or that's typically what I, I'm trying to see that there's some unif there's a unification principle though that's operative here, which is in, I think at least there's because if there isn't, why would the why would the images in your clinical example come to you if it wasn't from some other space and that we can speculate that your patient was unconsciously communicating to you. You were receptive to it on a really deep, intuitive, attuned level, but it becomes kind of dissociated in the sense that you're, the images that come up to you are not your own. They are taking the form of the dream or the daydream, the fantasy. But there was a, a motive element to it of a, a, a gift that you're giving the client of the of the protective angel from a an innocent child who 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 desperately wants it it clutches at it and so so it's so complex at this stage <laughs> that that it's it's exciting to actually even contemplate and discuss it well she was very dissociated from her body so i'm wondering if i was dreaming her image because i could and she couldn't i'm interested though that you bring in freud's drive because that seems to me to be nearer a notion of instinct I, I can see Beyond's O and uh, Jung's psychoid concept somehow 
fitting together more. I, I, I can't equate either of those with, with Freud's tree. In, in my mind. Of the, uh, you know, John, you're talking about, you know, that we have what seems like an innate fascination with wholeness. Um, but Jung says, you know, the ego cannot experience wholeness. So, I mean, we can experience ideas or longings or perhaps even images, but we can't act according to that bit of Jung, we can't experience wholeness. Um, but that there's a guy, Jean-Luc Merian, who's a French philosopher, and he says, um, you know, God is incomprehensible and we are incomprehensible to ourselves. So our own self incomprehensibility is the image of God. You know, the fact that I cannot understand myself, that is the image of God. Um, so I'm incomprehensible, God is incomprehensible. Um, I like that uh, idea that we're sort of stuck with the incomprehensibility. Yeah, but why do we need to bring God into the picture? That seems a little bit superfluous. Um, Everybody does. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm kind of just thinking of my own thoughts. You know, I, I kind of think, you know, at some level for Anne, this must have been an experience because it actually it it led you know it's actually it changed her life really i think you know i don't know maybe, maybe i'm exaggerating but but it led, led to a phd and it led to a deep interest so yeah. that, that that was that was driven that was that was, that was you know that's 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 not that's not intellectual that's 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 you know i feel that's that's you know that, that that's an experience of something yeah it gave me the energy to get through the PhD process. I was so fascinated by what was going on. Uh, of course, I then became interested in all the study, but yes, it did change my life. It, it, it injected energy into, the, into my life. I mean the, the part. I mean the kind of thing. The part of the paper which I, I liked actually was like, like you know, that kind of the split, and then synchronicities being kind of how how was expressed being ways of like correlations, correlations happening between between that kind of split um split world. Yeah. <clears throat> also, also made me think actually made me made me think of uh, Kalshid. Mm -hmm. Um. When he talks about, you know, he talks about the uh, when when children are severely traumatized, the idea, you know, it's a little bit they're they kind of linked they're linked to angels, <laughs> yeah. I'm interested and curious in my own practice where this can these kind of uncanny experiences that's kind of one way i think of them just utterly uncanny sometimes mind-blowingly so sometimes a bit less but they can happen much more often with some patients than with others some never mm. and i don't know if you have some thoughts about what what that might be about how come a, a certain pair you know me with paired with 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 some with, with somebody that our minds do that together very naturally and with with others it just just doesn't seem to happen i wonder if there is something whatever one made of laura's paper she talked about an openness to a really deep engagement She's calling it the psychoid realm, but you might also say to, to real depth work. 
and with some patients there is a depth of engagement that seems to be beyond. I, I don't think I'm going to use, I think this experience was mystical, but I don't think all these experiences are, but I do think there are experiences that are beyond the knowledge, the lived life of both parties in a deep engagement. And it's not always uh, needing five times a week work. Um, there's somebody I worked with once a week and I felt as if I was taken beyond in every single session. It was very, very hard work. He felt he couldn't bear five times or even three times a week. Um, but it was it, it it was work of a different order. Actually, I'm I'm coming up with a question, which is what I don't know how many of you are clinicians, which is what happens in the clinical session because I have an intellectual aspect which I called on to do the PhD and I uh, call on when I'm writing, but in the clinical session, I by and large move into a, a mind space of experience and waiting for something to emerge. But when I was interviewing people, it was interesting how some of them talked about, uh, Giles Clark talked about thinking like bloody mad in a session. So some people really employ their, their cognitive, their thinking facilities, um, but I, I think I, I open a space. So I'm curious as to what other people do. Yes, I, I agree that that is interesting. You know, some people their foundation or what they what they go back to in their minds a lot is theory in sessions. And I feel that I, I'm like you, experience. You know, of course, the, the theory is that probably my bloodstream or bone marrow or something, but that, you know, not not very present often in sessions, but it's experience. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of ex more experience um, led and just open to what's going to unfold. I suppose we're also influenced by the analysis we've had. Mm -hmm. I had an extremely experiential analysis. But what does that, what does that mean? Well, I think I started it from rather an intellectual point. And my analyst set about showing me, showing me? She, I don't think she showed me. Um, I think we got to that there were other experiences that I had been denying myself. Yeah. I mean, I think it's this amazing thing that most people out in the world have no idea about. You know, when we go into our consulting rooms, what kind of weird stuff happens um, that I just, and that as happens almost as a rule. I mean, a lot of just what happens might not be so uncanny particularly, but where, where two people get to uh, from the beginning of the session to the end and what kind of, what's created, what's played with and created. But in terms of like the uncanny, it can happen obviously right at the beginning. Like I had somebody have a, a first session um, in recent months and the very first thing I said to them as they came in regarding the whole kind of coming in and out. Uh, that was exactly what was in her dream when I asked, uh, you know, it was an initial consultation. And at some point I, sometimes I do, I ask about a dream and that was the dream that she had last night were the exact words that I had said to her just as, 
she was coming in. Um, so interesting. Jerry would be the um, difference then between synchronicity and the psychoid here. Um, I mean, I'm I'm interested in this this paper and this discussion because I wouldn't normally ordinarily think of it so much as the psychoid. A little bit like what David was saying, I would think more. I wouldn't even say a lot. I, I'm a bit strict with my thinking of synchronicity. Uh, a bit literal, I, you know, often there needs to be like a physical event as well, you know, <laughs> um, something flying into the room, you know, a bit like what could happen with Jung or, um, I reserve that sort of more, sort of, I think more about clairvoyance and the uncanny and the unconscious. Um, so um, I feel that the psychoid is really important to understand as a concept of something just how, infinite our psyches are or beyond our psyches just that just um the limitlessness um just knowing that in terms of clinical work i'm not i'm really not sure uh that's one reason i'm attending today i'm i'm not sure i'm interested but i'm not very quick to uh say oh that's from the psyche psych psychoid though the mind body the psyche you know body um <clears throat> connection is important in understanding that i suppose but um doesn't really come to mind so much i think of it all a bit more ordinary um that it's kind of like the ordinary stuff of analysis and sometimes it's mind boggling. So like in um, Anne's examples and some sometimes it's just, one even forgets to even um, remember it because that's kind of what happens when two psyches meet, you know, in the, the, meet, the analytic meeting of, of, of two people um, that within the frame, you know, within the Voss, what, what kind of miracles can happen um, and do happen. I suppose, I mean, you know, when uh, Raymond, you said about uh, this experience changed Anne's life, but, and then some of what's being said now, it makes me think about fate that some, with some people, there's a sense of fate that this person and I were fated to meet and be together. And whatever happens between us is going to have a big meaning and impact for both of us. Um, and that it, it, it couldn't be anybody else. They couldn't have anybody else as their therapist. <laughs> And uh, I, I had to have them as as my client or whatever. And um, so there is this kind of fate has brought us together and whatever we're doing has, has a fatedness. Um, so I don't know if that could be part of, you know, this area of, uh, of meeting that is kind of quite mysterious and uh, uh, we're not really in control of. Uh, we, we get swept up in it. Yeah, d d and d David, I'm a, you know, I think the way you expressed it in the sense that, you know, oh, it could only be the two of us. I feel that's, that's adding a, a different dimension to it. I feel that's adding, you know, I don't know how to express it, but it's, I feel that's kind of, you know, is is special. You know, I feel that's 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 a different. I, well, I feel I I can't express it. I feel that's a different. You know, it doesn't have to be. You know, um, because because you know because I I think I think it just could be. You know, you just in a sense it's just 
that this seems meaningful. It's potentially, you know, that kind of so it's you're kind of gripped by something, no? That's 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 where you kind of <clears throat> I'm just I, I I think those kind of relationships are not, you know, not frequent, but I do wonder to what, you know, are they another <laughs> Are they in this same realm or not? You know, they... I can uh, resonate with a little bit what's being said, I guess, if I can understand what's being said. Uh, this fatedness that we sometimes experience. Uh, I could think of it as uh, actually of the um, in Australia the indigenous people they have a walkabout and they they follow song lines. So if if I'm getting there if I'm doing a walkabout uh, together, uh, I wouldn't even say it's my patient. You know. Uh, are we doing a walkabout and are we following song lines? And that feels somehow fated. I don't know if you know that paper by a South African analyst about uh, healers. You know, they have these rituals and they uh, take the people who want to train as healers to the river to check whether the river gods, certain animals, are in sync with the gods of this clan, healing clan. So it's like they have to make sure the transpersonal mm -hmm. uh, thing is in alignment. <laughs> if it isn't, then you got to go train somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. But isn't it also in the area of um, participation mystique, which is, I guess, it's a little bit of a um, no-no, that word, you know, in terms of uh, not really supposed to say it, I suppose, now in terms of um, cultural sensitivity and reframing um, the theories. But um, um, I, I, do, I do wonder if we're kind of in that area as well. For sure. This, maybe that would be your death, best idea for a psychoid is that there is participation misty. Yeah, it's how I tend to look at it much more than psychoid, but I do wonder if I'm kind of been missing something. And, um, okay. I, I suppose I, I quite like Jung's seven sermons in thinking of the psychoid when he talks about the pleroma and the creatura. And I think of that as being deeper than participation mystique. But I'm not saying that I, I can intellectually um, justify that. That's, it's, I suppose I've done a certain amount of sorting in my mind. And whilst I say that I wanted to get in touch with what Jung had in his mind when he conceived these ideas, I've then done something with it, haven't I? And I, I still contemplate the psychoid as being really truly at, at the bottom, the depths, the way, way, way beyond our imagining. And whereas with something like participation mystique, when I think of my version of that, it is about the encounter in the consulting room. The, the two people 
engaged in a rather mysterious way together and having mysterious well uncanny experiences i'm i'm really I, i'm i'm quite surprised i've come at this from rather an experiential level today rather than from the the more the more intellectual sort of rigorous um sifting of of Jung's thinking and so on. Well, if you if you've had your uncanny experience together, uh, you could see that as a creation myth for your relationship. Yes. And as soon as you have a creation myth, you have some kind of path you can walk together. And I guess this was the first moment in that analysis that the two of us in my experience really came together in such an uncanny way, to, to use that word. It's so interesting how you've gone sort of full circle in a way, in that starting your analysis from a kind of more thinking intellectual place and then being moved into the experiential and then taking your experience um, as an analyst and then moving that into the intellectual with um, with your PhD. It sort of seems a, a really, a really nice circle. <laughs> and I thought a lot about creativity and forms of active imagination for my own interest. I, I, I have a passion for art. I'm not an artist. And therefore, this was an area that I just have an interest in generally, which accompanied me through the PhD. And I was really interested in the way the writing wrote itself to some extent. When I really started to do the whole thesis, it changed in front of my eyes. I thought I'd got a series of chapters and then I went around checking them and seeing what I wanted to do with them to pull them together into the thesis. And in the course of that period, the whole thing kind of changed on its own axis and I decided that that was a form of active imagination in its own right. So you went to the river and the spirits of the river said yes. <laughs> and they started speaking to me. <laughs> I know I got how I got to here, David. You, you suggested to me a few days ago that I might talk about how I got into this, and that's somehow become how the process developed in its own right.
which is also really interesting because I think rightly or wrongly of the psychoid is deeply kind of impersonal. Maybe that's wrong, but that's and then and yet today seems very um, personal. I think, I mean, Jung says that like the psychoid is neither psyche nor matter. So it's not, it's not matter, it's not psyche, it's a different thing altogether. So, um, so in that sense, this isn't what we would call personal or even material. It's a different thing. It's, it's, it's whatever it is, it's a, something else. Um. I suppose the only way we can know it really is about how we live something in our own lives that it might shed light on. But I suppose it, it connects with what Jung says about, you know, everybody has to uh, come to terms with infinity in their life. So I suppose thinking about the psychoid is one way of trying to come to some terms in some way with infinity. I suppose his Red Book work is also about that. And it, it's about assuming that knowledge can develop out of one's own personal experience and how you conceive that. It, from what we're talking about, it seems like if we can share, uh, we get somehow to know something. I don't know if we want to call it knowledge, but by sharing, we, we come to know something. We can know another person's mind or something together you can know something. Yeah. Because it's shared. You know, it's this idea I think that Jung is talking about that uh, individuation is uh, not done in isolation. There's always some kind of uh, exchange. There's a sharing. Um, I have a question about um, how did Jung come to the psychoid? And my apologies if we've already been talking about it or if it was in the paper, which I did read, but um, I can't seem to remember how did, how did Jung come to it? It was a term that was being discussed by biologists and uh, other people, uh, to, as, as Anne was saying, in part to think about teleology in organisms. Um, but so it wasn't, uh, you know, it was in, in the, scientific discussions at the time. He adopted the term and then started to make it his own. I, I, one of the interesting things about Jung is he conceived an interest in something really early on. I mean, it leads off in your lectures that there was ideas about the life force beginning to have an interest in in neo-vitalism and he picked up this word psychoid from Hans Driesch 
and his experiments with sea urchins and how if you separated the cells um, you would at an early stage when there are only four of them if you uh, you would still get a complete and perfect whole although apparently smaller than normal and he started thinking about uh, teleology and, and morphogenesis then and he he hung on to thoughts and went on bringing them up again and again and coming back to them. I mean, that's not the only, the, the term psychoid isn't the only case where, where he did that. It's as if he conceived something and then he went on thinking about it and he put it at the back of his mind and then he brought it forward and changed it and added to it. And did he ever speak about it as an experience? Did he have an experience that he felt was in, you know, had some relation to the psychoid? I don't think he actually described an experience in those terms. But he did talk about the transcendental nature of the archetype as if he would. Uh, so perhaps I've put together things from different areas of his discussion. Whereas there's a there's much more a trend nowadays to describe clinical experience in terms of somehow having a link with the psychoid dimension. Mine wasn't the first PhD covering this subject. I've got in my bookshelves a copy of a PhD by somebody called Kadagan, but it was in a very, very different vein. I tried to, I suppose I tried to impose something by looking at, at the history. What did you feel or find by adding history that you came to? I discovered in myself a real interest in the way things unfold his historically. I'm not a historian, although I've always had an interest in biography. Um, and I think the history provided some form of a containing frame for the study. And I suppose the psychoid could easily break out of such a containing frame. <laughs> Andre, you have your hand up. Yes, hello, Hi, everybody. Oh, hello, Andre. I, I was just wondering, maybe I can, um test out uh, uh, engineering perspective on the psychoid theory, because when you have a structure, for example, the structure has to has some vibrational patterns, every structure, every house, every bridge. And maybe, as I understood, uh, I stand corrected if needed, maybe in the analytic relationship, uh, encountering the psychoid dimension would be like, two persons on a bridge, jumping up and down, but jumping at the same pace in such a way that the bridge would flow normally. And it's like, like a pattern of the structure. This can be calculated, of course, but every house, every bridge has their own patterns, which can be uh, through, certain, through, through certain forces, they can be excited. Uh, like a bridge, for example, if one person goes over it, 
it's okay, but if a battalion goes over it and it's not well done, it can vibrate that much in their specific, in its specific frequency that the bridge can collapse. So I was wondering if psychoid and synchronicity could be similarly conceptualized, maybe in another area. I think that's a bit of the uncanny. I take it you've come across the Tacoma Narrows Bridge that did collapse yeah. because of the wind, the re it, it, its resonant frequency increased. And I spent a lot of time in my own analysis having fantasies about whether there would be a Tacoma Narrows Bridge between myself and my analyst and some kind of a, the resonance would cause a collapse. And how do you how do you guard against this type of situation against collapsing the bridge? I don't know, but I I felt that the containment in the analysis was sufficient that it didn't happen. Those were early fears in the analytic in my process analytic process as an analysand. I'm not sure that's answered your question, but it's where I got to with, with my thinking. Yes, thank you. Yeah. But it does make me think about how, you know, experiences where it feels like something gets unleashed in the relationship and it, it we can't deal with it and eventually the thing collapses <laughs> um and it's like it's like on both parties with the best will in the world we can't get through it something's on something's happened and it's uh it's gonna fall And that reminds me of the experience where Jung and Freud, uh, something happens and the closet goes crack and, and Freud faints. And I don't think, for, it, you know, this, what I guess, what you're saying, David, about that happens and it never comes good. It doesn't get, you never get into a relationship. I haven't had that uh, in 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 a in, a, in an anal uh, analytic uh, situation, uh, but I've had it in just in life uh, uh, experiences. So I'm trying to feel into that what what that could be when you really lose each other. You know, then I'm left with a feeling that I wasn't up to it, whatever the challenge was, whatever oh. the demand was of the therapy. Um, I didn't have it in me to respond. And they, they also didn't have it in them to get through it. But that's a bit, that's very sad if you've been meeting for quite a long time. But my parents grew up in Tacoma, so they went down with everybody else to watch the bridge fall. Uh, 
And didn't Lara Lagbertina um, say in this paper that on two or three occasions when she was talking about something in this realm happening, it was when she thought that there might be an ending. She thought the mouse would startle her female patient and that would cause a rupture. And she thought by moving to Canada Waters, her male patient would finish with her. And it was around about those times when there was a crack that more experience was let in, <laughs> if you like. I think there was another person as well. Where something final might have, have happened to cause a crack, but then the, the experience was of, because of this communication, this deep down communication, it sort of gave them a bridge <laughs> of sorts for a while anyway. Yeah, that kind of makes me think. Actually, you know, I don't. It's actually a long time since I read it. But um, my point I made, uh, what I said earlier about uh, culture, you know, the, the children who are very tra traumatized, since it kind of, it's that kind of in those kind of really, you know, the traumatic experiences that the kind of like idea of something like being held, being held by angels, really, you no. Know? Yeah. So they they can't be. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not expressing it very well. I like this thing in Jung where he says, you know, there often there'll come a time in the analysis where the analyst has to stand back and let the the person find their own way. And it's in those experiences that they really find out who they are. They find out what they're made of. Um, so it's it, in that way, it's in a sense, it's not the relationship with the analyst or even the container. It's just the accompaniment um, and the person, you know, having an encounter with themselves. You know, it's, uh, Thank you very much, Anne. I don't know if you, you there's any thoughts you have to bring us to a close here. Um, I think my response to what you were just saying about an encounter with oneself, I my feeling is it is an encounter in a relationship. That it was the relationship is the relationship and analysis, which somehow brings this alive. It's always felt to me to be about the other as well as oneself. Thank you very much, everybody, for your thoughts. I'm greatly appreciative of them. Thank you very much for enriching us. Yes, th thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ian. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.